Uh, welcome to today's public lecture. Uh, it is our sincere pleasure to welcome to Montana Tech Professor Ethan Stroke from Utah Valley University. Uh, Professor Stroke uh, is uh, both very active in writing and rhetoric, but also chairs the uh, writing studies program uh, at UVU. To provide a little bit of background, I'm going to embarrass you here, so hopefully you don't mind. Uh, Professor Stroke earned his PhD in English Rhetoric and Composition from Purdue University. Uh, before that, he completed a Master of Arts in English Rhetoric uh, from Brigham Young, a Master of Arts in Science Fiction Studies from the University of Liverpool, a Bachelor of Art in Philosophy from Utah Valley University, and then a Bachelor of English from Brigham Young University as well. Uh, Professor Stroke serves as the curator of the Digital Archives for the Kenneth Burke uh, Society, uh, and he also has work published in the Journal of Mormon Studies, as well as a forthcoming compilation, as I understand. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Stroke. Hi, thank you very much. <laughs> um, For the camera, can we pretend this is like a Pearl Jam concert or something? <laughs> Dr. Sprout, everyone! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, uh, when you hear uh, technical communication and words like rhetoric, uh, you, uh, you tend to uh, uh, think a lot of boring things. Um, I'm going to favor and pass those back that way. Should be one there for you, too. Uh, and uh, that's not the case uh, with anything I study, so I always find it surprising when uh, uh, someone finds uh, some, some of what I study boy. Um, the, uh, I, I'd like to begin uh, by reading the scary uh, abstract that I, um, that I uh, gave for this uh, talk. Uh, I'm not quite sure how else to find it. I know it's advertised on my uh, English department. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for that kind introduction, by the way. Uh, here we go. Okay. So uh, this is the flyer that went around a little bit um, uh, for this uh, uh, this. Uh, lecture, Beyond Utility, Humanist Philology of Technical Communication. Uh, the abstract, technical communication is a translational activity with a traditional motivational locus in utility. However, most translation theorists' efforts to fold technical communication into translation studies deal with translating technical documents from one national language to another. In contrast, this lecture engages translation theories to reassess uh, some foundational technical communication principles that stem from classical deliberative rhetoric. In the end, this lecture advocates a wider spread awareness of Aristotle's terms uh, for deliber deliber deliberative rhetoric in their original undomesticated foreignness. This is an important step toward reappropriating rhetorical principles that can redress various abuses that have been facilitated by technical communications dependence on a Roman inherited uh, deliberative ethic of utility. Um, so uh, I begin with that. Uh, because the abstract is part of the point of my of this lecture, uh, that abstract was written in such a way that you that a lot of people would need a translator for it. <laughs> uh, th there seems to be a certain academic way of speaking that uh, we as academics uh, and students uh, become accustomed to. Uh, that you know we could unpack. Uh, all those terms, and and I could uh, spend a long time arguing and justifying why, you know, that was the most compact and and dense I could make it in such a constrained amount of space. Uh, but uh, the the very jargonness of it uh, is what makes it um, an ideal springing off point for what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is uh, the methodology of philology. Uh, applied to the field of technical communication. Uh, I, I'd like to begin with uh, a very uh, close to home example here. Uh, the seal for Montana Tech 
of uh, the University of Montana, uh, says uh, De Re Metallica, which is uh, a Latin phrase uh, that we'll dive into in just a moment. Uh, it also happens to be, uh, as uh, many of you, some may know, uh, the title of the very first modern book on mining and metallurgy. Uh, it was uh, the, the, from the Latin, it literally means on the nature or subject of metals or, or, or minerals. Uh, the book was published in 1556. Uh, and, uh, but what I like about <laughs> your university, your school's uh, motto is that it connotes finding some ancient unrefined buried substance. I love this. Bringing it out into the light and seeing what can be done with it. That, I would say, is the study of philology applied to language. Uh, I love Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, I read the entire run in its entirety as it came out in the papers. Uh, and, uh, and I have this comic uh, in a banner form, three feet tall and about seven feet wide, hanging on my office wall to keep me grounded. Uh, Calvin says, I used to hate writing assignments, but now I enjoy them. I realize that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, obscure poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. With a little practice, writing can be an intimidating and impenetrable fog. Want to see my book report? Thomas. Or Hobbes, rather. The dynamics of interbeing and monological imperatives in Dick and Jane, a study in psychic transrelational gender modes. Academia, here I come. Mm -hmm. That's my abstract. But let's look on uh, the flip side of this. Uh, corporate jargon. Uh, Dilbert, also a huge fan. Uh, Wally, did you Uberize the slide deck? I harmonized it in the cloud. Are we ready for a trans domain kickoff? I put a disruptive mesh network in the microservices of the Internet of Things. Would that be good enough to ask the fridge, or do I need to start dis disintermediating? It depends on if we have enough bandwidth to growth hack the analytics. I just hope our clicks and mortar strategy staircases. Dilbert. I'm almost certain that was nonsense. Wally. Sometimes it's about the journey. So we have uh, these two walls of discourse that uh, inhibit <coughs> access in a certain way. Uh, I'd like uh, to just start out with just a notion of what philology is before we dive into these different translational ideas. Uh, it's a, uh, most simply put, a research methodology uh, focused on translation. Uh, it comes from the Greek, means love of words. Uh, the main term or, or tool in it is, uh, is called diachronic diachronic analysis, uh, which is really looking at the development of words and phrases, not only across time, but across languages. Uh, this is especially useful in translation studies, uh, where there is uh, uh, more of a preference given for uh, a sense-for-sense -sense translation, rather than a word-for-word -word translation. Uh, if, if you know anyone who speaks multiple languages, uh, you, you find yourself in conversations where they may say, well, there's no exact word for that, but it basically means this. And that process, sense for sense, is, is the, uh, right now the dominant uh, uh, voice uh, overall in translation studies. Uh, because uh, if we were to, to translate uh, sentences word for word uh, from one language to another, uh, well, I mean, Many times, the syntax doesn't even make sense. Uh, like the, the, where the nouns and verbs and objects and prepositions and all those are just in different places or don't exist. Um, the, uh, and so uh, philology is not merely just a correct inter interpretation of text. Uh, it's about mapping textual appropriations uh, through interpretation, uh, and, uh, which helps us own the implications of our inter interpretations as we employ them. Uh, so this, this applies to not only uh, texts that we get from, from a different uh, national language or, or uh, like from Spanish to English, uh, but it also applies uh, 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 looking at um, uh, spheres of discourse in a philological manner. 
helps us on the implications of how we are sense for sense translating something um, and what we may be losing uh, from the word for word translation, translating or what we may be uh, changing to suit our own domestic concerns uh, or our own, like domestic as in like home, uh, land, right, our, our culture. Our own domestic uh, 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 philology helps us face and own um, what we domesticate when we translate into our own sphere of understanding. Uh, but what does this mean for engineering and tech com? Uh, let's start with uh, who accreditates Montana Tech. Uh, Montana Tech's engineering programs are accredited by the Engineering Accreditation uh, Commission. Uh, I just verified this uh, a couple days ago. Uh, the EAC is one of four accreditation commissions organized under the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology. Uh, ABET or ABET. Uh, today, ABET is a federation of 35 engineering societies and companies encompassing all realms of engineering research and development. And ABET was formed in 1980 as a reorganization of the Engineers Council for Professional Development. Uh, what I'm doing here is tracing an organizational genealogy where we're going to get to some important definitions. The ECPD, again, that's the Engineers Council for Professional Development was established in 1932 when the largest seven American engineering societies joined together into one <coughs> federated body. By 1947, ECPD had accredited 580 undergraduate engineering programs at 133 institutions. In that same year, ECPD published its first Canons of Ethics for Engineers. That's interesting to me, right? They only started uh, accrediting a second mode of, uh, uh, of engineering courses the year before in 1946. Uh, and then by 1947, they had expanded greatly and, and one of their primary concerns was publishing a code of ethics, canons of ethics for engineers. Um, and now every current engineering society now has its uh, own statement of ethics, every single one. On the websites, check them out, they're awesome. Um, in the Canons of Ethics for Engineers in 1947, we get this definition of what engineering means. The creative scientific principles to design or develop structures, machines, apparatus, or manufacturing processes, or works utilizing them singly or in combination, or to construct or operate the same with full cognizance of their design, or to forecast their behavior under specific op operating conditions, and then this part blows me away. All as respects as intended function, economics of operation, and safety to life and property. That's the definition, the foundational definition of engineering, of the organization that eventually grew to become the organization that accredits this institution to be an engineering, uh, uh, an engineering school. Um, that last part is interesting uh, because uh, that hasn't always been an essential and necessary component. Uh, from the forward, just a bit more from this uh, Canons of Ethics for Engineers. Um, this is uh, the f some of the first words that they wrote into this document. Justice, courtesy, and sincerity exercised with honesty, wisdom, and mutual interest between people make the foundation of ethics. That's arguable, but it's interesting that it's like the second or third sentence in a book by and for engineers. This ethical code is prepared for the guidance of engineers and engineering students and is aimed to express a consensus of considered judgment on certain matters of common interest to engineers. Ethics should be more than passive observance, uh, than passive observance a code of uh, don'ts in the life of uh, an engineer. They should be recognized as dynamic principles guiding his conduct and way of life. And apparently this is back in a time when only men were engineers, so um, there were female engineers, they just, okay, we get that, all right. So uh, from the list of then ethical principles that follow, you, we find these interesting statements. The engineer will interest himself in the public welfare and be ready to apply his special knowledge, skill, and training for the benefit of mankind. This ethical code is prepared for the guidance of engineers and engineering students and is aimed to express a consensus of considered judgment on certain matters of common interest to engineers. Ethics should be more, oh man, I just read all that, didn't I? 
Um, the, uh, I want to compare this. I want to compare this to um, uh, the, a previously widely uh, popular book on engineering uh, called Efficiency as a Basis for Operation and Wages uh, by Harrington Emerson, who was an efficiency uh, systems management specialist in the early 1900s. Um, in his uh, view, to attain the high efficiency of the atomic energy of the fish, the high mechanical efficiency of the bird, the high lightning efficiency of the firefly, is not an ethical or financial or social problem, but an engineering problem. And to the engineering profession, rather than to any other, must we look for salvation from our distinctly human ills, so grievously and pathetically great. It's about 909 that this was written. What I find interesting is that uh, this same basic conceit, not in a negative sense, uh, but a uh, as uh, assertion of the viability and usefulness of engineering, is, is still pervasive in many fields of engineering today. Uh, if any of you have uh, read uh, or, or seen interviews of uh, um, anything that Ray Kurzweil has said, um, I don't know if he's still a uh, chief engineer for Google, but he's a notable futurist, uh, author of The Singularity, Singularity is Near, uh, is convinced that a combination of artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and um, something else will make us immortal in the next 40 years or so. He's, he's really hoping for that anyway, because he's getting old. Um, but what I find interesting is that in many ways, the ECPD's 1947 Canons of Ethics for Engineers is a response to the previously widely popular 1909 Efficiency as a Basis for Operation and Wages by um, uh, Harrington Emerson. For ECPD, engineering is a service for humanity. That was clear. For Emerson, engineering is the savior of humanity. For both, engineering is an activity of translation. Yes, translation. Um, for ECPD in 1947, engineering involves translating technical knowledge, skill, and training to fit the needs of the human condition. For Harrington Emerson in 1909, however, engineering apparently involved translating the human condition according to the efficient capacities of engineering. I can go back to the quotes if you want to see that, but that's kind of what they were doing. Now this, um, why? Uh, here's, it, this is a question I had when I looked at these two, this development uh, a philology of sorts, of spheres of discourse about engineering. Why this subtle yet profoundly significant shift in conceptualizing the role of engineering in a time span of just less than 40 years? Um, in true mining fashion, let's dig up an artifact that might help us understand the ideological shifts in engineering between 1909 and 1947. Uh, let's read the 1942 Special Action Group memo uh, that you have right here. Uh, to Walter Ralph from Eust, you can read along. Uh, to Walter Ralph from Eust, June 5th, 1942. Subject, changes for special vehicles now in service. Since December 1941, 97,000 have been processed by the three vehicles in service with no major incidents. In light of, of observations made so far, however, the following technical changes are needed. The van's, one, the van's normal load is usually nine per square yard. In sour vehicles, which are very spacious, maximum, maximum use of space is impossible, not because of any possible overload, but because loading to full capacity would affect the vehicle's stability. So reduction of the load space seems necessary. It must absolutely be reduced by a yard instead of trying to solve the problem as hitherto by reducing the number of pieces loaded. Besides, this extends the operating time as the empty void must be filled with carbon monoxide. On the other hand, if the load space is reduced, and the vehicle is packed solid, the operating time can be considerably shortened. The manufacturers told us during a discussion that reducing the size of the van's rear would throw it badly off balance. The front axle, they claim, would be overloaded. 
In fact, the balance is automatically restored because the merchandise aboard displays uh, during the operation a natural tendency to rush to the rear doors and is mainly fine lying there at the end of the operation, so the front axle is not overloaded. The lighting, too. The lighting must be better protected than now. The lamps must be enclosed in a steel grid to prevent there being damage. Lights could be eliminated since they apparently are never used. However, it has been observed <coughs> that when the doors are shut, the, Lord always, the load always presses hard against them as soon as darkness sets in. This is because the load naturally rushes towards the light when darkness sets in, which makes closing the doors difficult. Also, because of the alarming nature of darkness, screaming always occurs when the doors are closed. It would therefore be useful to light the lamp before and during the first moments of the operation. Three, for easy cleaning of the vehicle, there must be a sealed drain in the middle of the floor. The drainage holes cover eight to 12 inches in diameter would be equipped with a slanting trap so that fluid liquids can drain off during the operation. During cleaning, the drain can be used to ex ex evacuate large pieces of dirt. The aforementioned technical changes are to be made to vehicles in service only when they come in for repairs. As for the 10 vehicles ordered from Sauer, they must be equipped with all innovations and changes shown by use and experience to be necessary. Now, on the surface, this is a pretty straightforward and uh, well-worded and versed uh, memo piece of technical communication. Uh, did anyone catch anything disturbing about it? Right over here. Uh, I recognize where it's, uh, what it's being used for. Um, mainly number two, obviously, is the more disturbing part referring to, uh, well, <laughs> to the screen. It's used by the Nazis. There you go. What this is, it's a memo describing the technical needs of the Sauer vans, uh, which were uh, a precursor to the brick and mortar gas chambers used by the Nazis in the final solution for eradicating uh, the Jews from Europe. Uh, and not to mention Roman gypsies and Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, uh, gays and lesbians and, and any and all political uh, ideological opponents. Um, the, the words highlighted in red in the next few frames refer to human beings, pieces, merchandise, the load, large pieces of dirt, corporate jargon. I get this memo and the next few little bit from uh, work, early work done by a colleague of mine named Steve Katz, who is a professor of uh, rhetoric, composition, technical communication, design, and whatnot at uh, Clemson University. Uh, one of the most brilliant, brilliant people I've had the privilege to, um, to uh, visit with. Um, in an a early uh, 1992 article of his called The Ethic of Expediency, uh, which I would recommend everyone read, uh, he, he uh, puts the full uh, text of this memo and says, here, as in most technical writing and in most deliberative rhetoric, the focus is on expediency, on technical criteria as a means to an end. For Aristotle, he's going to rhetoric now, expediency seems to become an ethical end in itself. Expediency is always the good. Utility is a good thing, Aristotle says, concluding any end is a good. The ethical problem presented in Nazi technical rhetoric is a problem of deliberative rhetoric. Katz says, defined by Aristotle as that genre of rhetoric concerned with deliberating future courses of action. The ethic of expediency, which Aristotle first treated systematically in the rhetoric, was rhetorically em embraced by the Nazi regime and, com and com combined with science and technology to form the moral basis of the Holocaust. Um, it is the ethic of expediency that enables deliberative rhetoric. Um, now, if you're someone who's trained in rhetoric like I am, this study of Stephen Katz's is profoundly disturbing and unsettling. Not, not just because of the horrific details of the uh, Holocaust or the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, banality of atrocity, um, you know, evidence in the, in, the, in the language of the memo, 
Um, but it's unsettling to me because rhetoric is my discipline. Um, Aristotle, one of the pillars of what we do. Um, but also, before I, before I veer too far there, I want, I want to pause and, and ask again, huh, why the shift in ideology in the ways that we describe engineering from 1909 to 1947? Um, well, you, you can, did you have something because to say? Because of the atomic bomb and the Holocaust. The, 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 technical, uh, the technological advances in World War II um, surpassed human understanding um, in their capacity of, of uh, human destruction and loss of life. Uh, and so, uh, of course, the engineering societies immediately after the war, very interested in, uh, in focusing all of their um, efforts in a way of really building a new vocabulary. Uh, because the vocabulary of engineering, of technical communication that, that, that uh, uh, was used uh, from, oh, I can even, probably as far back as Francis Bacon, um, up through World War II, um, came from the medieval education, the classical education of rhetoric, grammar, and mathematics, uh, and uh, in which that rhetoric tradition was inherited uh, by, uh, well, all of those were inherited from the Roman educational uh, sort of tradition given to uh, decaying Europe after the fall of Rome. Uh, those Roman interpretations of uh, chief of which Cicero is king, uh, determined a lot of how rhetoric and uh, communicating necessity to others um, was taught uh, throughout the Middle Ages and through the Enlightenment and into the modern industrial age. Uh, Cicero is also a key figure in the discipline of translation studies in that it is uh, in his discussion of Latin, translation, Latin translations of Greek texts where he advocates a sense for sense translation of what the Greeks actually said. In other words, if we take what the Greeks actually said, it doesn't make, fully sense, it might make full sense in Latin, uh, so we just try to get to the heart of it. This is problematic in, uh, in Latin uh, translations of Aristotle in a number of ways. I'm only going to focus on one, which are th uh, the three key, on uh, one area, which is the three key er uh, terms um, in uh, Aristotle's notion of deliberative rhetoric. Uh, from line 1362a in Aristotle's rhetoric, this is a 1932 translation. Uh, the highlighted words are words that uh, I'm going to uh, separate out and show you in a, show in a grid uh, and how they line up. Now the aim of one who gives counsel is utility, what is expedient. For men deliberate not about the ends to be attained, but about the means of attaining these, and the means are expedient uh, to do. Since this is so, and since anything expedient is a good, we must make sense of the elementary notions of good and expedient in general. Now this is a, the same passage from a 1984 translation, uh, from a 1984 translation. Now the deliberative order's aim is utility. Deliberation seeks to determine not ends, but the means to ends. In other words, what is most useful to do. Further, utility is a good thing. We ought therefore to assure ourselves of the main facts about goodness and utility in general. Lastly, George Kennedy's translation, uh, who, uh, Kennedy's translation is respected more than others nowadays, uh, from 2007. This is how he translates the exact same passage. But since the objective of the deliberative speaker is the advantageous, symphoron, he puts that word in there, and since people do not deliberate about this objective, but about means that contribute to it, and these means are things advantageous in terms of actions, and since the advantageous is a good, 
One should grasp the elements of good and, advantage and advantageous in the abstract. Notice how, um, like, the more abstract the translation became, the more current it got. Because the more current the translations became, the more that these translators were trying to get at really what the Greek words were saying, rather than relying instead on early Latin translations of the Greek, and Latin is a much easier uh, language to port over into English than Greek. Uh, so these are the words that, are, that were highlighted in those uh, passages, and, these are the, and, and their corresponding words in the, in the original Greek. Aim, objective, and ends were all, tra uh, all, all translations of the word telos, or telos. Deliberation, deliberative, or give counsel is, uh, uh, were all translations of the word symboludicon. And expediency, utility, and advantageous are uh, translations of, wor of the word symphoron. Okay, this is deep philology. Okay, stay with me. Stay with me. Uh, we are digging up something that feels raw and unrefined. And what does it mean? Let's bring it into the light of day. Uh, so let's look at these. Um, uh, let's just do a brief overview of where we are. Technical communication has roots in deliberative rhetoric. If the rhetorical motives of deliberation are suspect, then the rhetorical motives of technical communication are suspect too. So the guiding questions here is, do we understand exactly what the rhetorical motives of deliberation and technical communication are or can be? Um, Cicero was so convinced of the separation of ethics and rhetoric that uh, he suggested that the stronger that this faculty for rhetoric is, the more necessary it is for, for it to be combined with integrity and supreme wisdom. And if we bestow fluency of speech on persons devoid of those virtues, we shall have not made orators of them, but shall have put weapons into the hands of madmen. Turn on the election news. Um, traditionally, um, Cicero and beyond, uh, rhetoric and ethics are different activities. Rhetoric is non-ethical. It's like a-ethical. Like there's no, it's, it's just something independent of ethics. Conscientious rhetorists uh, apply ethical concerns, like conscientious engineers today apply ethical concerns. Uh, and ethics is non-rhetorical. It's just simply concerns about what is good or bad, different notions of it. On the contrary, I contend, rhetoric and ethics are inextricably intertwined. Uh, rhetoric is pervasively ethical. Rhetors cannot not engage ethical concerns for the simple reason whenever you are in any conversation of identification or persuasion, when you're dealing with an ought of any kind, you are you suddenly find yourself in the realm of ethics. Um, ethics, <coughs> on the same token, is unavoidably rhetorical. You cannot build a notion of the good without convincing your audience that it is good. <clears throat> uh, Kenneth Burke, this is a picture uh, uh, close to when he died. Um, he explained our, 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 uh, some of the quandary that's involved here in this way. People seek for vocabularies that are reflections of reality. To this end, they must develop vocabularies that are selections of reality. And any selection of reality must, in certain, certain circumstances, function as a deflection of reality. Is your head like, blah, 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 blah? OK. Because that, that's, that's what I, my brain does when I first read Burke, which is kind of a little hula dance in my head. Um, the, uh, but, but look at what he's saying. And this is a translation issue. Not only, not, only, not only from language to language, but I'm talking about the last argument you had with your mom or dad. Or the last moment, that last awkward interaction with a teacher where you're like, I don't understand why I got this grade. Um, in those moments, people are trying to articulate the words, the vocabularies, 
that are adequate reflections of the situation as they see it. But because we only have a moment and limited, and limited words at hand, um, we are only able at best to frame a selection and anything that is a selection deflects everything else. This is the core difficulty of translation. It is the core difficulty of, of, uh, <coughs> of, uh, of the engineer um, seeing a human need and designing some magnificent new mechanism or tool to fill that need. Um, the, the engineers in uh, innovations are in this way a kind of uh, symbolic interaction with the human, human world around the engineer. Um, but, but every such effort is an uh, uh, effort at reflection, is a selection, is a deflection. In other words, it's not possible for us, without contradiction, to, to recreate in, worlds, in words a world which is itself not verbal at all. Um, it, I have to zoom ahead. Let's go back to this. Telos, symboluticon, symphron. Um, the uh, uh, telos stands alone well on itself. Symboluticon uh, is uh, a combination of two Greek words, uh, sim, which means together, and boule, which uh, means uh, will or, um, well, will, like the will inside you, dis the decision, the thing that moves you, the will. Um, the, uh, and then uh, symphoron comes from sim and pharaoh, together in pharaoh. A pharaoh actually survived in the Latin. Uh, uh, along with the uh, Latin, uh, Latin didn't have sin, but Latin had con, C-O-N, and, and we combine that with fur, and we get confer. That survived just fine. Um, and so when uh, Cicero um, is working with a translation from Greek, and he talked a lot about translation, so he knew, <laughs> he knew that he had a word for simfero, uh, for simferon, and it was confero, to confer. Um, and and that, that lexical gap in translational history, I still have not found an explanation for. Other than Cicero's justification that he's just trying to go for a sense for sense translation. Um, so uh, these are literal um, uh, boule, uh, will, or decisions. Um, Pharaoh, sorry, the, um, I, I didn't, uh, tell you this, uh, it means to bear, like to carry, to um, heft and lift and right, to, to bear. And so, um, and telos is such an interesting word. Um, and is the closest English approximation from all those previous tr translations. But it really means completion. Um, and a related word in telekia and telkia is, uh, which Kenneth Burke uses a lot in his work, is is something that has a sense of completion within itself. Um, it's, it's, uh, I'm going to talk about telos in more in just a moment, but, um, but when we look at these words um, in their, in their uh, undomesticated formness, we get a totally different sense of what, um, of what uh, the Roman tradition uh, passed on to us and then and then, and then allowed for us to uh, use in the language of, uh, of genocide. Um, so the Roman translation, the objective aim or end of deliberative communicators is utility or what is expedient or advantageous. Um, the literal translation, like the best I can approximate for the sense is to complete decisions together, communicators bear together. Can we just look at those again? This is not just one word. It's three key words in, in the ways that uh, Aristotle's um, definition of deliberative rhetoric gets handed down to us. Um, Aristotle's, uh, so Cicero, ah, oh, Cicero. Um, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't even lambast the guy because he was murdered in such an awful way with his head on the spike at the, End of the you know the entrance of the city of Rome. I mean I can't oh, as much as I'd like to complain about him. He got a horrible end. 
Um, but Aristotle accepts expediency as the end of deliberative uh, oratory. Um, the word that, this is in De Invenzione, um, in uh, the word for expediency there that Cicero uses is the Latin word utilitas, utility, um, and not confero. I don't know why. And I have yet to uh, meet a, 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 a classic of uh, ancients that, that can tell me why uh, beyond uh, Cicero's assertion of, well, that sense didn't quite work in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Latin. Uh, deliberation itself a bastardization. Daily bro, it li literally means I consider. Um, now let's, uh, um, if, uh, so, so Cicero's version of Aristotle um, is a version of quite is a version of question begging, which is a premise that relies on a conclusion. I give this meme. This was this is old, back from the drone debate, um, uh, where um, uh, Congress uh, Congressman Paul um, was uh, complaining about drones, and he says, "So you can murder anyone you want any anywhere at any time." President Obama, yeah, but I pro probably won't. But but um, Paul's. Uh, argument about our concern about drones relies on the assumption that drones are going to be anyway so anyway premise that relies on conclusion um, if synfront equals utility and if symbol ludicon equals I consider then of course deliberation lends itself to abuse of course it does um, the uh, it's uh, if if, uh, let, me, let me phrase it this way. If, if I were to frame deliberative rhetoric in terms of, well, the goal of it is to get what I consider to be expedient or advantageous, then is it any wonder that the entire discipline of rhetoric has still has this baggage attached to it of like uh, being the art of abject bastards isn't a surprise at all. Um, when, when the terms, the, the, the Cicero's or whoever's efforts to reflect reality deflected so much else. Um, telos is particularly uh, germane to technical communication concerns. Um, it's not merely end or aim or purpose, but completion, fulfillment, consummate, as in a consummate manager or a consummate crook, something that is so itself consummate. Um, uh, I uh, get a little bit of this from Martin Heidegger, um, talking about Nazis. <laughs> um, he defined uh, his study of Greek uh, and of the early lectures of uh, Aristotle defines telos of, as that which is outermost, beyond which there is nothing there that makes uh, the being even more genuine. Um, telos is not stasis. Those of you familiar with uh, rhetorical old rhetoric words, stasis or stasis, the um, uh, question of stasis is what do these rhetorical agents share? It's like the question of like common ground. You know, what, what subject matter can we get uh, people to first agree on and then proceed deliberation from there? Telos is different from that. Telos is uh, what will complete the situation among these rhetorical agents. Where is this conversation heading? And all of us have been, I bet even today, most people in here have been in a conversation where it started out one way and then there was something that the other person said and you realized, oh, I see where this is heading. That is an observation of telos. But we've lacked the vocabulary. Uh, it's been a lexical gap of sorts for us. Um, so telos and technical communication. Just, just this one addition to our vocabulary for technical communication um, makes profound ethical, um, or has profound ethical implications. Um, what happens after this document leaves my influence? Where is this whole project heading? How will this end? Um, 
Also, uh, identifying stakeholders, the people that are bearing this together with you. Uh, this project, you know, whether it's uh, uh, whatever it is, um, identify who they are. Those directly involved, those indirectly affected, those remotely affected. If, if all you do are those two rhetorical strategies, you suddenly find yourself firmly planted on moral ground. Telos and identifying who are the human beings here? All the human beings here. Um, this is from a textbook. Technical communication is a process of managing technical information in ways that allow people to take action. Um, TechCom deals with imminent decisions. Concerns of telos merely make the future seriously as, oh, sorry. Concerns of telos merely take the future seriously as part of rhetorical situations. Um, the rhetorical situation is not something that is just happening now. It's something that has future. Uh, let me show you this. Hopefully this will load up. Oh, of course it brought up this. Okay, this is good enough. Um, Edward Tufte is a, a notable statistician where he saw this graphic in a, uh, uh, in a uh, academic medical journal uh, classifying cancer types by their survival rates and, um, and he hated it. Um, he, uh, he suggested different, um, uh, different variations of it um, by you know, organizing them by longevity, right? Um, by expected longevity, or even just adding a simple space line uh, a trajectory so that you can see where, you know, how survival rates go. Um, this is part of a sublime post of his on his blog where he rails against auto-generated PowerPoint graphs. He says if you plug the same data into, power, into a PowerPoint, um, you get images like this. Let me zoom in as much as possible. <laughs> Sorry, like th th this is this is dark, like gallows laughter here, because <coughs> every visual element contributes to understanding. Okay, and in those PowerPoint slides, everything is wrong with these smarmy, nearly unreadable graphs. These graphics would take would turn into a particularly nasty prank if ever used for a serious purpose, <coughs> such as cancer patients <coughs> seeking to assess their survival chances. Ouch. Uh, the ways that we project graphically in our modes of technical communication can have this sort of weight. Um, uh, here's one that's a bit more lighthearted. Um, I, uh, I have a Roku TV now. Um, this is not a, a, a support for a Roku um, uh, brand. Um, the, um, uh, but this uh, was a study in uh, uh, technical manuals for the old Roku device, a little black box that uh, was a precursor to smart TVs, right? You know, you put the black box, hook it up to your TV, and the black box wirelessly connected to your router, and then you've got your Netflix channel, and your Amazon Prime, and your Hulu, and your um, my mother in law watches Acorn. Um, and so uh, these, um, th th this is uh, generation one Roku box. Um, and this is generation two or three. Let's look at them a bit more closely. Connect to your network, this is generation one. To use your player, you must connect it to your home network. Typically, customers connect to a wireless or wired ra wa router rather than directly to a broadband modem. Choose wireless or wired setup below, then fo follow the guided uh, setup on screen to complete the wireless process, is anyone else asleep yet besides me? For real. This is a Roku device. What are you going to be doing with this thing as soon as you figure this the freak out and get it hooked up? You're going to be binging the hell out of it. Right? You know, with your, with your bay or not, but with some goodies at least. And that show that you've been meaning to watch forever is going into your brain as quickly as you can get it. This, this manual like this has none of that. Check out this one. This is generation two or three. 
Um, first of all, the chartreuse or whatever the shade of uh, color is. So like, whoa, hi. <laughs> uh, or or the uh, the uh, the difference in cover. Uh, th this one is uh, get started, plug in, connect, watch, practically marching orders, right? With a straight down view, like it's on some sort of like mortician stable. Um, but uh, this one, hi, let's get started. There's something happening there that, uh, uh, look at this. Um, step three establishes your network connection and brings out your inner geek. You can do it. Just choose either wireless or wired and read on for instructions. Uh, down below, do's and don'ts on where to place your Roku player. Do place your player within range of your wireless network. Don't place your player in an enclosed cabinet. It may interfere with the wireless signal. Don't place your player beneath anything. It may cause the player to overheat. Eeks. What the freak? But the playfulness in this technical communication shows an understanding of what the, what the user is going to be doing really soon. Something fun. Um, I uh, had another example of a snowboard helmet, and the graphic didn't work. Um, but the uh, camera on me, yeah. Uh, let's just do this uh, right here. Um, the, the, uh, the, the snowboard instructions, uh, helmet instructions I had, uh, had the same kind of slang language, you know, almost like they were written by a snowboarder. If any of you have never met a snowboarder, like hardcore snowboard, snowboarder, that they, they have a job and a place to sleep during the warm months. But when it's cold and the snow's on the slopes, they're there, right? And the snowboard helmet um, instructions was written in that same kind of playful tone. And, and, and the way that that invites you in, and, and it shows you the correct way of placing it on and whatnot, OK, that's all kind of funny and whatnot. But notice, if someone wears their helmet correctly, their likelihood of surviving a bad fall improves. And what was playful in technical communication now emerges as being profoundly moral, life-saving. So in the end, Telos, uh, where is this all going? Uh, expanding of vocabularies is difficult. Uh, we like receiving communication that is easily digestible, that conforms to what, to our sort of like cultural frame of reference or systems management frame of reference in the company. That's domesticated technical communication. I would suggest that the future poses challenges for engineers, innovators, technologists, um, managers, uh, any kind of boss, and most especially for technical communicators, uh, to seek ways to uh, slow down that communication process just a tiny bit, uh, to get people thinking about what happens next. Where is this going from here? Who are the people involved? We can point to successful strategies like this, like uh, Subaru Corporation's Kaizen uh, management policy, which I, uh, or, uh, innovation uh, uh, policy, which allows the lowest employee to pitch innovation ideas to the CEO. Absolutely incredible. Um, we can point to management styles that are at least reflective of this, like the CEO of Costco, whose um, contract is one page, no golden parachute. What CEO does that? Um, and, and, we can, and we can look to uh, management styles in Silicon Valley, uh, where, uh, where odd things two decades ago are now commonplace. Uh, Childcare facilities, uh, uh, flexibility for odd work hours, uh, so that you can fit the rest of your life in what you do for work. 
um, things like scooters in the hallways. Uh, very mundane, uh, but, but this is the challenge. Uh, if, is looking beyond the mere utility of our communication. Uh, as communicators, as engineers, looking beyond it, um, finding where the humans are, and not simply the processes. Thank you. That was a few minutes too long. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, any questions? Um, back there. Yeah, so I thought that logi did not mean words. I thought it meant, and it's going way back to when I was in high school, philo me has to do with loving, right? Right. And, and logi has to do with studies or science or not mm. just words. I thought the word for words was something different now. I'm not a classic expert. Nor am I. Um, but the thing is, you know, if you love study, if logi means study, like biology, sort of, it doesn't mean bio, you know, life words, it means life study of. Or, um, you know, there's a lot of logis that I can't think of right now. But if it's study of or something similar, then that's very different than being words. And so love of study is different from love of words. And I'm curious uh, because, in fact, the love of study of technical communication strikes me as being more substantive than the love of words of technical communication. Oh, I think you and I get along smashingly. Um, here's something I do know about Logos, or Logi. Um, Logos... Uh, logic, too. Mm, and that's the way we inherited it from the, uh, the, uh, through the Middle Ages and whatnot. Uh, Logos in Greek means word. Um, and we can see it translated that way in the Gospel of St. John. Very beginning of that uh, book in what is colloquially called, it's the Greek Bible, the, the New Testament. Um, in the beginning was Logos, or the Word. And Logos was with God, or the Word was with God. And Logos was God, or Word was God. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the shift, now if we look at, at Word as the foundational Lego block that builds the magnificent Pirates of the Caribbean uh, ship or the big castle or the, or the space shuttle structure, whatever. Um, Logos is the content of all that we have and are as symbol using animals. And so, what constitutes our study of anything are the study of the words for that thing, if that makes sense. And so, um, that's and that's where the where I, I believe, and I'd have to, to, to shore up a bit more in my classical um, studies, but, um, but that, that's where that semantic shift makes sense, where if logos is word, which it is, um, and logi has been handed down to us as the study of something, well, it's when we study anything, we're really just studying the words and symbols for it. Um, because there's no studying a thing without knowing the words and symbols for it. Uh, there's a hand over here, or no? I have many questions, but I don't okay. want to Sure, you betcha. Um, that question was fantastic. Um, a similar um, shift happened with the word ethos, which gets handed to us as like credibility or um, you know, like respectability or something. But uh, in Homer, in the Iliad, um, it's uh, where we first see the word. Um, it's used to describe the accustomed dwelling haunts of animals. <laughs> WTF? <laughs> um, and and what, but, uh, what pared down, ethos, is, is dwelling. It's, it's, it's where you live. It's where you're coming from. You, see in the sh you start to see the shift here, right? And so, um, and so the, the logos, ethos, pathos, tri um, triangle, that gets that got passed down to us, which was really a hobbled 
uh, Pentagon because it was missing Kairos and Telos, um, uh, got got passed down to us in a way that that uh, were a few steps away from how they were originally used. Um, if uh, I I can, so it, understanding these foundational rhetorical terms in this way um, looks at them not as strategies, but as but as uh, analytic elements of any part of speech. Because every speech has logos. Um, every person's coming from somewhere has ethos, dwelling, where they dwell. Um, yeah. So um, assuming Kurzweil and other futurists are right, as our technology um, begins to expand at such a rapid rate, and you kind of hinted at this in talking about how um, the technology changes of World War II, how yeah. our language and understanding wasn't able to keep up. If the Kurzweil idea or theories are true, then how do you see philology keeping up with the new <laughs> emergent technologies that we're seeing? Uh, so, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, with, with the new emergent technologies. That we're constantly seeing. That we're constantly seeing. Uh, so, uh, if I can rephrase the question to make sure I understand, uh, Moore's law that predicts that, uh, that like, uh, basically the uh, capacity of uh, uh, computer processing power goes up exponentially every however many years. Mm -hmm. uh, we were a bit behind until IBM made their new uh, chip uh, a year or so ago, and then now we're back on track. We don't have hardware that's advanced enough for that new IBM chip yet. Um, and so, uh, the, and then, uh, so there's Moore's Law, but also this idea of, of, the, of what Kurzweil called, and other, other futurists called the singularity, mm -hmm. uh, which they take from uh, physics, like the singularity of a black hole. But they refer to it at that point uh, in the near future in which um, the boundaries between technology and humanity become so blurred that um, our predictive models break down. Um, and so that would be my answer that uh, my predictive models for what the study of language means in a condition where the difference between human and technology is indistinct, um, I don't have any predictive models for. That was totally a chicken out answer. Well, that's the same answer <laughs> they always get to, so. That was a good question. Uh, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much for um, letting me stay a little bit longer, uh, and for uh, staying with me through all these boring old Greek words. But, uh, um, thanks uh, for coming out. Uh,